Good day to you. Have you ever seen the television show Intervention on the A&E channel on cable television? Yeah, Intervention. You know, that's a show where you have an addict. It could be a person who is addicted to heroin or methamphetamine or drinking or sex or gambling. And the whole family gets together with a professional and they intervene. They intervene in that person's lives to try and get them to seek counseling, therapy, or rehabilitation. And it's an interesting show because it shows real people who are real addicts and it actually shows them, in many cases, using drugs, using shooting up heroin, shooting up methamphetamine, shooting up meth. And so when you watch that show, it's quite riveting. But is that show really fair to the people who are addicts? I mean, when you're an addict, are you in your right mind? Can you actually make a decision to go on a television show and make that decision rationally? Or are you desperate when you're an addict? Are you de desperate for money? Are you out of your head so you don't know who you're, what you're agreeing to or who you're agreeing with? Is that what's going on in a show like that? And then what about people who never used drugs, who see this show, particularly young people? What about young people who see how to shoot up heroin, how to smoke a joint, how to drink to excess? What about people who see that on this show? There's a lot of things going on in that show, Intervention, right? It's bringing up a lot of ethical quandaries. It's bringing up a lot of questions about what is right and what is wrong. And that's what we're talking about today. We're talking about media ethics today as we take on our very final chapter in this class. Chapter 15, taking on media ethics. Ethics is different from morals. Do you know the difference? Morals are personal and they are built on some kind of code of understanding and that code is not necessarily rational. For example, religion is a code of morals, but it's not rational. It's based on faith, right? It's not based on, on rational evidence, right? So morals are personal. We live by morals each and every day. I don't, I don't know about you, but when I pass by a a waste paper basket, I don't even call it that really, trash can, and I have a bottle cap, and if I throw the bottle cap at it and I miss, I cannot keep walking. It's my personal moral that that is just wrong to litter, especially a bottle cap. So we make personal moral decisions each and every day, and that, those are different from ethics. Ethics, ethics are the academic study of the rational ways to act when we are faced with ethical decisions to make. Ethics is an academic body of study and it goes way back in time to ancient Greek philosophers. That's where we're gonna be starting very shortly. Ethics is a formal study of what is right and what is wrong. And it does not mean that everybody agrees on what is right or what is wrong. We'll be giving some examples today that'll really push you, I think, as to how you truly believe. Ethics really is, is all about at the end of the day when you lay your head down on the pillow, can you sleep? Do you feel good about yourself? That's what it's all about. Ethics, especially when it comes to media, we're going to give some examples of media today. So let's take on our very first ethicist, if you want to say that. Actually, these are philosophers. These are heavy thinkers. And this person happens to be the founder of communication and, and also my own personal idol when it comes to academics. We're talking about Aristotle here. Aristotle, we're talking 350 BC, that's when Aristotle was writing about ethics. And Aristotle's main contribution to the study of ethics is the golden mean. <clears throat> the golden mean. So the golden mean is acting according to finding the mean between two extremes. So human beings are prone to extreme behavior. So you have extremes at one end and you have extremes at the other end. The golden mean is in the middle it's striking the balance between two extremes so for example one extreme of human beings is cowardice aristotle says cowardice and cowardice is is being afraid to do the right thing it's like standing by and watching a uh, or standing by when somebody makes a racist comment and not saying anything that's that's cowardice right the other side of uh, of cowardice is uh is foolish rashness let's say foolish right is acting impulsively right so that's when you when you if somebody uh, utters a racial epithet then you say a racial epithet back to them right to show them how hurtful it is that could be another extreme on the other side so aristotle says no no the golden mean is about striking the balance in the middle it's about finding a way to 
ward off these two extremes. And Aristotle was no light thinker. I mean, after all, he was the he was the the teacher of Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great, who walked all over the world and conquered the known world as we know it, the great military commander. And Aristotle's teacher was Plato. Plato, the famous philosopher discussing truth. And Plato's teacher was Socrates. Socrates. So that's quite the lineage of teachers there in Aristotle. And and so when you when you go to create media content, uh, the question is, can you strike that balance down the middle? Now, reacting to Aristotle is our next ethical philosopher, our next ethicist we're going to talk about. He's a German. His name is Immanuel Kant, K-A-N-T, Immanuel Kant. And his main contribution to the study of ethics is what we call the categorical imperative. The categorical imperative, which means that no matter what, you always act. You always act according to universal laws, no matter what. These are universal laws, like thou shalt not kill. That's an example of a so-called universal law in the Bible. That's, that's an example of how Kant's uh, method of, of, uh, of determining what's right or wrong should be approached. It's, it's asking first, what is the ultimate law that I must follow? And then I have to follow it. So in other words, Kant is saying that morality lies not in... Not in the actor, like Aristotle did. Aristotle said it's in the character of a person. That's how you determine whether they're striking the golden mean. Kant says, no, 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 it's not in the, it's not in the actor. It's in the action, the action. So, for example, honesty, right? Honesty is something that we say is a, is a categorical imperative. You should always be honest, or some people say that. And so what happens on a television show if you have a reality TV show like the Kardashians, and one of the characters on the show asks another character, hey, how do I look? Well, what do you say if you don't think they look good? What do you say if you think they look overweight? What do you say if you, you think they look underweight? Do you say anything? According to the categorical imperative, even if it hurts a person's feelings, that's an area because it's a, it's a universal law. Tell the truth that you should say, hey, you don't look that good, actually. You want my honest opinion? You, you, know, you don't look that good. And so the categorical imperative doesn't really take into account people's feelings or really the consequences of making ethical decisions. Now we're going to move on to an area that does take those consequences into consideration, and it's going to be brought about by our next ethicist, our next ethical philosopher, who is John Stuart Mill. John Stuart Mill, he has three names, and his main contribution is what we call utilitarianism. Utilitarianism, which is the principle of the greatest good for the greatest number of people. That's what utilitarianism is, the greatest good for the greatest number of people. John Stuart Mill was a British thinker writing in the 1800s, and he says under utilitarianism that consequences of actions are important in deciding what is ethical, that actions that improve society are superior to an individual's life or a small group of individuals. It's really all about the society and what is the greatest good for the greatest number of people. <laughs> And the same act under John Stuart Mill can cause happiness, and it can also cause pain. Uh, somebody could watch a public service announcement for a child who's in a wheelchair, who is uh, being, who's appearing in the public service announcement to raise money for UNICEF or some other nonprofit. Uh, one person that could be very, very painful for because maybe they have uh, somebody with cerebral palsy in, in their family. Uh, another person that could be very uplifting for to, to see that. So the same act can cause both pleasure and pain. So you have to find out what causes the pleasure. And it works like this. If I was to be meeting with all of you in this class today in person, and I was to say, here's a radio set, a radio receiver. I'm going to leave the room, and when I come back, can you guys have a radio station that you're listening to? If I were to walk out and come back, what, what kind of station do you think would be playing? Would it be heavy metal? No. Would it be country? Probably not. Would it be hip-hop? Probably not, even though that's probably everybody's most favorite kind of music. It probably would be top 40 be top 40 top 40 greatest hits radio station because all those other genres would have enough people who don't like them to change the group opinion about whether that radio station should be played and so what ends up getting played is the least offensive radio station which is a top 40 station it's not a station that anybody would say oh i'm absolutely in love with that station no it's just like it's the least objectionable right and that's what utilitarianism is the greatest good 
for the greatest number of people. We actually have a term that we use to, to describe what this does to media content. We use the term lowest common denominator, lowest common denominator. It's like any reality TV show where you have, quote unquote, the gay guy. You have, quote unquote, the dumb blonde. You have, quote unquote, the straight gay male. I'm, I'm stereotyping, but you know what I'm saying, right? You have these shows that have all of these characters trying to capture the diversity of America <clears throat> so that everybody has somebody in that show that they can identify with who's watching the show. And that's what greatest good to the greatest number of people is about. Now let's move on to the next ethicist, the next ethical philosopher. John Rawls is his name. He's an American philosopher. John Rawls, W-A-R-L-S, John Rawls, an American philosopher. And, and his main contribution is the veil of ignorance, the veil of ignorance, which I'll explain in a moment. He says, John Rawls, that that which is just is also fair. That which is just, that means if justice is served, also fairness is served and those are two different things like justice is when somebody is receiving a decision and it's going to that decision is going to decide whether they need to pay a penalty or whether they deserve to go free that's what that's what justice is and that's very different about fairness right <clears throat> you can have justice you can have a person who wins a lawsuit on a technicality but they still committed the crime and so that's not fairness right but that's not what John Rawls is saying is that which is just is also fair and John Rawls was mostly concerned about the unfairness <clears throat> for eth for um, ethnic minorities and and ec economic minorities people who are poor he was concerned about the fairness for those people when they are speaking to others so he developed this veil of ignorance idea which is the idea that when you speak to somebody who's different from you looks different from you you don't see the difference. You have a veil in front of you. And that veil is going to create ignorance about what the other person looks like. So that you don't judge the other person based on what they look like. And that is actually a principle that we use in academia when we publish journal articles. When I published what are known as blind journal articles, I published a few of those in my career, you send in the article without your name attached to it as a professor so that nobody knows who the article is coming from. So that no decision about the article is based on your reputation and that's what veil of ignorance is all about is you you don't care whether a person's black or white or asian or hispanic <clears throat> or are uh, native american you don't, you don't you don't see it right there's a veil in front of you and according to rawls we still got to work on this that's why women today earn 82 or to 83 cents on the dollar to what males earn for doing the same job <clears throat> okay, that's not racial equality. So when you hire, hire somebody in a media organization, don't pay attention to whether they're a woman or not. All right, we're going to move on now to the next ethical perspective. This one comes from a familiar person. It's Hutchins. You remember Hutchins from the Hutchins Commission? Robert Hutchins, the Chicago professor in social responsibility. We talked about it earlier. Now we're going to talk about it as being an ethical perspective. And again, the setting, to remind you, <clears throat> was just after World War II, there was a lot of cynicism in the United States. The newspapers were carrying stories that were scaring the American public about war, making the American public think that the Soviet Union and the United States were going to go to war very, very soon. And uh, there was the Kill a Jap Today um, film trailer that was playing in many film and many uh, movie theaters. Before you'd watch a film, you'd have Kill a Jap Today to... I guess build up uh, support for the war, even though it's dubious the way that they were, that the way that it was done, in my opinion. So, <clears throat> this was the kind of media content that was going around. And Robert Hutchins says, "No media, media have to be more responsible. Media have to recognize they have a privileged position in society. They can, they can command thousands or millions of people every time they deliver their product. So, media need to be truthful and intelligent. Media need to offer a forum for the exchange of comment and criticism." Media need to clarify goals and values of society like democracy or freedom or education or, or health. Media need to provide full access to the day's news. <clears throat> These are all principles of the social responsibility perspective. And finally, we come to our last ethical perspective. It comes from our only female philosophical thinker that we're covering from the book's readings. And it's Cecilia Bach. Cecilia Bach, that's who we're talking about here. And, and she has what's known as the Bach method, right? She doesn't have like a gold mean or any contribution like that. She has the Bach method. And she was mostly concerned with understanding different people's perspectives in making ethical 
decisions. And so she says you have three, three steps that you have to go through in making decisions related to life in general, but in this context, mass media. And step number one is to consult your conscience. What do you believe? What, what, what do you believe? And then secondly, seek alternatives. What are some al different ways of thinking about the decision that you're facing? <clears throat> and thirdly, hold an imaginary dialogue with everybody involved. Hold an imaginary dialogue with everybody involved. I don't know what you think about drowning stories in the news. Do you ever see those kinds of stories in the summer here in Pennsylvania? Every summer. Every summer there are two or three males who drown in the Delaware River. They they drink alcohol and then they think that they can swim across to New Jersey or they're just naive. They just jump in and they don't realize that that Delaware is a very fast moving river. And whenever these deaths occur, the camera crew comes out and what do they shoot? They shoot the yellow tape. They shoot the vehicle. They shoot the river. They don't shoot the person. We don't see the body coming out of the river. So we just say, of course not. That's rude, right? But we, families are eating their meals at at dinner time, when they see the news, they don't want to see that. That's that kind of the thinking that goes on. But what about showing the body? What about if we talk to <clears throat> people who knew that young boy and they said, I would do anything to stop another person from thinking they can swim across this river, even if that means <clears throat> showing the body, which we wouldn't do. So this might be a way of Cecilia Box decision making taking place as you're putting yourself okay I, I know that I, I'm, I, I'm, a, I'm a regular reporter we just don't show bodies but I'm going to put myself in the shoes of somebody who knew that person who died and and I'm going to hold a dialogue would they like to see that if it saves another person's life that may came, I may come up with a different way of covering the story All right now that we've covered ethical perspectives <clears throat> we're going to cover different issues having to do with ethics in the media and the first issue we're going to cover is truthfulness Truth does matter in the media, especially in journalism. That's why we had the whole rise of the concept fake news, basically trying to say that whatever the news is that's being called fake is not to be believed, and that matters. But unfortunately, we do have examples in the media of journalists not telling the truth. You can read about Juliet Cook, for example. She was a reporter for the Washington Post newspaper who made up a story about a child heroin addict. A child heroin addict. <clears throat> It was a riveting story. It captured all of Washington um, and those who were reading the newspaper. And unfortunately, it wasn't true. But Juliet Cook says, well, you know what? It is true because there are eight-year-old heroin addicts in Washington, D.C. And even though the specific person that I wrote about did not exist, the phenomenon does. <clears throat> so my question to you is, did that journalism cause a change that, even though it was fake, a change that was worth it? Did somebody do something about an eight-year-old boy they knew was using heroin? That, that's a question that you can ask yourself. I said that ethics are thorny sometimes, and you have to make up the decision for yourself. But the, the point is, is you're going through an academic, <clears throat> reasoned method in arriving at the way that you think. All right, so let's move on to the next issue now. The next issue is conflict of interest, conflict of interest. And this is where somebody has an alternate interest that affects their decision-making in the area of media. <clears throat> the most common kinds of conflict of interest that we talk about are when people sit on boards of companies and then they also are in the media. So let's say that you're sitting on the board of a pharmaceutical company, or let's say that you're sitting on the board of a local hospital, or let's say that you're sitting on the board of the, of the school board for teachers. And because you're a living in the community and you want to be a person who's co contributing to the community, you end up on that, but you're also a reporter that can bring about problems. When you have somebody like Jeff Bezos, Jeff Bezos, who is a multimillionaire, billionaire even, he owns Amazon, right? But Amazon owns the Washington Post. Amazon owns the Washington Post. Do you think the Washington Post is ever going to cover a labor um, issue at Amazon? Let's say that there's a strike. Uh, or let's say that the workers are complaining about safety conditions, driving those trucks around all day long and sitting in, in sitting positions. Will we ever hear stories about that? Ever read stories about that in the Washington Post? That's what a conflict of interest it can indicate, right? Will Disney ever cover on ABC News an accident at Disney World if it ever occurs. Conflict of interest, right? That's, that's what we're talking about. A lot of times it's not necessarily that there is 
a conflict of interest, but rather that there is the appearance of a conflict of, in, of interest. Is there, Andrew Cuomo, um, he just had to, uh, well, he resigned as governor of New York, and then his, his brother, Chris Cuomo, on CNN, was let go by CNN because Chris Cuomo had the appearance of advising Andrew Cuomo on how to defend himself against sexual harassment allegations, which is what brought down his governorship. And so Chris Cuomo was fired because of the appearance of a conflict of interest. He can be both a news anchor and also helping his brother. All right, next up is the issue of sensationalism. Sensationalism, this is really an outgrowth of profit-making in the media because profit-making is what drives the content in media. And really, if you can have something that's sensational rather than, than boring, it's what's going to get a person to read a newspaper, to watch a television show. That's why you have a show like Ridiculousness. That's why you have that show. <clears throat> it's sensational coverage. See people doing crazy, crazy things, right? <clears throat> Just flat out, people, people like out... <clears throat> Excuse me. People like outrageous news. They like to see people doing lurid and emotional things. They like to be entertained. And we have a term that describes sensationalism. It's called tabloidization. Tabloidization, that's when even the respectable media, like NBC News or CNN or Fox, even those media, when they start to report on what the tabloids are reporting on, they're starting to carry news on Betty White. Betty White passed away. She was 99 years old. Yeah, that's a tremendous achievement, but after all, she is an entertainer. And so you have the news covering Betty White as a lead story when there's the pandemic and there's the economy and there's all kinds of other big problems in the world. Next up is the issue of apologizing. When do you apologize? Well, it's really different for print media versus broadcast media. And broadcast media, generally speaking, do not apologize <clears throat> because if you do, it draws attention to the mistake and people will then fixate on what happened more than if the apology was not issued. I, I'm not speaking all the time, but in general, you don't. But in print media, newspapers, magazines, on web pages, generally speaking, you do apologize if you get a fact wrong because it's already in print and it's already permanent, so you have to correct it. <clears throat> Another ethical issue is photography. Photography is at the heart of many ethical decisions, actually, because Photographs can be manipulated so easily. <clears throat> you can manipulate the size, the shape, the color. Um, almost every entertainer who you see on the web or in magazines has been doctored their photograph. They've had their skin put through filters and wrinkles eliminated, etc. And uh, <clears throat> a lot of times when celebrities are covered by the media, they're, the photographs of them are capturing them with angry faces or crazy faces. <clears throat> and so there's an ethical issue about photography and whether photography really tells the truth at all. Now we're going to raise the question of how do you enforce ethics? If you have a media organization and you have a code of ethics, as many organizations do, they have booklets that they give to their employees that have their particular code of ethics. How do you enforce? How do you enforce that? Well, one way that you enforce it is through a code of ethics. So the Society for Professional Journalists, they have a code of ethics. The uh, Public Relations Society Professionals, they have a code of ethics. Things like, if you're a journalist at a TV station, you cannot accept gifts <clears throat> that are worth more than $25 because of the potential conflict of interest. That is a, that's in the code. When you get hired, do you agree that you're going to abide by that behavior? That's one way of enforcing ethics. Another way of enforcing ethics is what some media organizations do. They have what's known as an ombudsman. Is that a new word for you, ombudsman? It should be ombudsperson, O-M-B-U-D, ombudsman. This is a neutral person who represents consumers as well as reporters. And so if you're a person who's covered and the newspaper accuses you of being drunk in public, what's your recourse? or accuses you of being at a neighbor's house who was just arrested for criminal activity, what's your recourse? What can you do? You can go to an ombudsman if the organization has one, like a Washington Post or a BBC World Service, and you can say, I want you to act on my behalf. I want you to represent me to the reporter. I want you to see if you can get a retraction issued. And if not, I want to be given the right to respond myself, the right to reply in the newspaper. That's what an ombudsman can arrange for you. It's it's where a media organization agrees that they're going to abide by whatever the ombudsman decides, and the ombudsman settles things, but mostly is representing the consumer, the average citizen. 
Now let's talk about ethics and advertising. We had a whole class on advertising, and we know that advertising is just not truthful. We know it's not truthful. You can hear that something's free. There's a contest that's going on that's free, but oh, there's a catch. You have to apply, and there's an application fee. Or we hear that if you buy one, get one free, but the offer expires by midnight tonight. That's not always getting to buy one, get one free. We see a clearance rack from 99 cents and up. Okay, nothing on the rack is 99 cents. Everything is, is up. So there's a lot of criticism of advertising that it just is not truthful. And actually the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, has laws about what constitutes the use of the word free and has laws about what you can say in an advertising campaign or a promotion for a product in the media. And generally speaking, advertisers, they don't want their products associated with wrong imagery. That's really why we have so much control on obscenity in our country. It's, it's, not, it's not necessarily because we consider it to be immoral or unethical. It's because advertisers like Tide, uh, that's a company that's a Tide detergent, which is owned by Procter & Gamble. They have a vested interest in their product only be associate, being associated with cleanliness. That's part of the branding of Tide detergent. And so they don't want to be on shows that are up against the wall when it comes to profanity, et cetera. Now let's move on to ethics and public relations. In public relations, the PRSA, the Public Relations Society of America, established a code of, of ethics in 1954. And uh, that code of ethics is trying to keep that occupation and profession in an, in an ethical way. We discussed some of the ambiguity of ethics when we discussed uh, public relations last time. And now we're going to finish with one particular issue related to video gaming. It has to do with misogyny. Do you know that term, misogyny? That's where a woman is abused by a male, either verbally or physically. That's what misogyny is, M-I-S-O-G-N-Y. And, and there's Gamergate illustrating the misogyny that takes place in the video gaming world. So you have Zoe Quinn, um, successful gamer, and she was... Uh, treated misogynistically by males, uh, threatening to rape her because she was successful, uh, threatening to harm her, uh, calling out parts of her body, her breasts, etc. That's Women go through that more than men. That's what happens in some cases in the video gaming world, and it's an ethical issue having to do with video gaming. And it's, it's not that different in television as well. You have the ESPN reporter, Erin Andrews. Um, she got into men's locker rooms, um, football locker rooms is very difficult to do and you can get a lot of good stories in a locker room and and then uh, it was uh, taken license that she was secretly recorded in the dressing in her own dressing room and uh, she sued about that it's something that doesn't happen with men right it's misogynistic and it occurs in media settings unfortunately and that's going to wrap up our class discussion on media ethics it's for you to decide but hopefully your decision is based in an academic framework have a great day and best of luck to you for your future.